am very pleased to have Lorena Barba here from from the George Washington University. Moved. Uh, yeah. From the George Washington University, and um, I'm sure everybody here is very interested in hearing her speak about flying snakes on GPUs. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Nvidia, for the invitation. So now for something completely different. Uh, we're going to talk about an application that we're working on in our lab and um, um, just for fun what we're doing with flying snakes. So uh, this is work I want to acknowledge um, carried out by my student Anush Krishnan who is at Boston University uh, now uh, on, in a, on an off-campus uh, assignment at GW, my new institution. So other acknowledgments for uh, uh, the funders that I've received some support for this work, in particular NVIDIA um, uh, through the academic partnership uh, program in 2011 and the CUDA Fellow program. So flying snakes. Here's a picture of actually, I wonder if you can see it well. You can probably, do, you can probably picture here. Let me see if I can get my mouse into the, um, there we are, main screen. So. As you can see in this picture, this looks like a rather flat body for a snake, right? Snakes are all cylindrical, but these guys are pretty funny because when they fly, they flatten out. And I'm, let me show you first a video with no audio, uh, just a short video with some clips from a field work by my collaborator. Here he is, Jake Soha, a biologist who has done investigations of the flying snakes in the field. And here are some high speed uh, camera captures of the flying snakes. They can turn in mid-air, as you can see. Here's Jake Soha analyzing some video captured on the field. This is from YouTube. You can probably find it very easily with a little Googling. As you can see, they s undulate in the air, wiggling about. Uh, I uh, turned off the audio of this video because it's actually in Japanese. Here is the launch. You can barely see it jumping from a tree branch. It's just all a few more seconds. Another capture there of the snakes. As, as you can conclude now, they don't actually fly. They glide. They're quite small, as you can see in this picture, only about two centimeters in diameter and only about a meter long and so it's not that easy to get details of their aerodynamics from just these video captures they're quite small here is their jumping maneuver from a tree branch as you can see they take off with much ease and they glide through the air here's a picture of one of the five known species of gliding snakes the paradise tree snake as you can see they're also quite beautiful so from the videos, you probably got more or less of an idea of how they do, they do this. They actually um, swirl around, they, they curl around a tree branch and use their tail to grab onto that tree branch as the rest of their body is hanging in a J shaped, as shown up here, and they just jump off. As they gather speed in a ballistic dive, they um, adopt this shape that you can see over here, an S-shaped flat um, um, on, on, in the air and can have uh, glide angles as low as 15 to 35 degrees, which is actually very good. They can uh, travel quite a bit of horizontal distance as they fall. Here is a, couple, uh, a picture of the body of the snake in mid-air. So as they fall, they flatten immediately their body. They actually open up their ribs um, and flatten their bodies to adopt what you could see here is a cross-section that looks more or less like a uh, triangular cross-section. As they wiggle in the air, pieces of their body are in cross-flow and work as sections of a wing, producing lift. So the question is, how do these guys produce any lift so that they can glide so well? Here is an a, a artist's impression of how they change the body geometry to become this morphing wing. And a, a, another picture of the cross section and a plan form picture of the snake mid-glide showing that some sections of the body are acting as pieces of wing. Now, the snakes operate in a very interesting um, uh, op uh, Reynolds number, which is uh, a, a number that we use in aerodynamics to sort of 
uh, identify the operating range of different flyers. Um, so they're between birds and insects in that sense, and so the physics of the flow is very special. So a couple of things that are important in this study, lift and wakes. How do the snakes generate lift? So you probably know a little bit about lift. Lift is generated when the air flows around a streamlined surface and you have high speed and low pressure in the upper surface and you have low speed and high pressure in the lower surface. Um, but how do the snakes do it? That's one ingredient. The second ingredient is wakes. Here is a um, visualization of the flow past a cylinder. In this case, you can see that there's a very interesting wake formed behind the cylinder. And this is called a von Karman vortex street. And any object that is not streamlined will form this type of wake. Very uh, intense vortices behind this object. And at the bottom is a a uh, graph that illustrates that in this situation you actually have a uh, lift force that changes in time. You have an oscillat oscillatory time signature for lift. So this is ha what happens in reality for the snake because the body is quite thick and so you do have some wake behind the object and you have therefore lift force that is oscillating in time. But if we take an average of that oscillation you can get an indication of the aerodynamic performance of this, of this uh, object mid-flight. So uh, my collaborators did some experiments with a three-dimensional reconstruction of the body of the snake. And they put this in a water tunnel, like a wind tunnel. Here is a, um, you know, an illustration of what might happen when you put an object in a wind tunnel and you are somehow able to get some um, measurements. So they put a section through, um, on a wind tunnel and measured the lift force. It would have looked something like this, like an oscillation, and then they take the average. They put the section, which as I showed you before, has this shape like a triangle. So moving forward, they put that section in the wind tunnel at different angles, and they observed something very interesting, which is as the angle of this section is increased, the coefficient of lift, the average coefficient of lift, in a time, um, in, 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 a, in a good section of time, increases as you increase the angle, which is more or less expected, but a particular angle of attack at a large enough uh, speed of the flow, you get this extra boost of lift. We call that some lift enhancement, and that was very interesting and very mysterious. This appeared in the experiments, and we set out to investigate this with simulations. So we constructed a CFD uh, representation of the snakes in a computer program that was coded uh, in um, C++ and CUDA. This is work that of my student Anush Krishnan, who implemented an immersed boundary method, uh, which simply means that one can put a complicated surface in the flow without having to deal very much with complex meshes. So it is a simple enough mesh to generate, but there are some um, special techniques to be used to be able to solve the CFD equations in that case. This is a simulation that runs uh, almost entirely on the GPU. And in eventually, to solve this problem, this CFD uh, simulation, you get a linear system of algebraic equations. This code used CUSP, one a library that is available to solve a linear system of equations. Uh, we were very happy that there, there's a library to provide that because we don't want to be coding linear solvers. And we are hoping that with our uh, parallel code, which is already coded up in Petsy, which is a, li a library as well for parallel computing. We're hoping that the soon-to-be-announced uh, NVIDIA uh, solver might be useful for us as well in that context. So this is a single GPU simulation so far, single GPU solution of a pressure type uh, CFD, CFD solver. So if you want more details, you, you're welcome to visit our website and uh, read our papers. But I just wanted to tell you the gist of this. And the um, interesting results of this research is that the simulations were also able to obtain this interesting peak in the lift coefficient at a particular angle of attack. Now, we don't know if the flying snakes use this particular angle of attack for their operation in midair, but we do know that this is interesting and one would want to understand the physics, what's happening there. So in the experiments, you saw that the snakes are pretty small. In the experiments, it would be quite hard to actually get 
the details of what's happening there with the flow around the snakes, but in the simulations we can get very detailed images of what's happening. This is an animation obtained from the simulations of the um, anatomically correct cross-section of a flying snake at a particular angle of attack, 30. So if you look at here, our previous graph, at 30 there's this um, lower angle of attack. At 35, which is the next animation I'm going to show you, there's this extra peak, this extra boost in the lift coefficient. So look at the wake here and see if you notice any difference between this wake and the following. This is the wake signature of the high lift situation. So there are many things that one can observe there. The wake is more compact. Um, uh, there's things about the frequency of shedding of those vortices that one can observe. And uh, we can measure details uh, of the pressure um, signature, for example. The pressure signature, signature around the body. This is the average pressure distribution around the body and um, you can see that for different angles of attack 25 30 and 35 you get in the case of 35 that extra suction in the leading edge and uh, in the case of 35 with a higher Reynolds number you get this increased suction all uh, all, of, all all across the upper surface so this increased suction is contributing to that extra lift. We see that in the signature that is obtained from these calculations, but we don't know why. So how can you investigate this a little further? Here is another way to uh, look at the pressure signature, uh, comparing three different angles of attack and looking at the pressure signature for the point of maximum lift. Remember that the lift oscillates and so this is the point of maximum lift and comparing different angles of attack for one Reynolds number or different Reynolds number for one angle of attack. The simulations allow you to look uh, not only in biology they act as a microscope, a virtual microscope, but also in fluid mechanics. You can zoom in to what's happening very close to the body and try to understand how the flow is swirling around in this particular geometry, this particular object. So we looked at the um, these lines represent contours of a quantity that um, measures how much fluid is rotating. So the blue would be rotating in one direction like this, the red would be rotating in the opposite direction. Okay, so red is positive uh, rotation and blue is negative rotation. You see that as the uh, main vortex that forms over here uh, from the leading edge, um, uh, develops, there's also some of this red uh, over here that penetrates underneath. We call that secondary vorticity. Secondary in the sense that it has been induced by this main vortex over here. So there's some interesting physics happening here that we want to investigate further. So here are some snapshots at different points in time. These different snapshots show us that there is some of this vorticity, this rotation of the flow that exists over here underneath, underneath the main large vortex. And they even go all the way to the leading edge at some point. You have this opposite sign vorticity, this red little bit going all the way to the front. So that means that this um, uh, blue part over here is acting what somewhat like what we call a shear layer, a free shear layer. And it um, is uh, able then to roll up over here and start the new vortex, the new big blue vortex that um, exists in the leading edge. Now vortices, if you think about a tornado, um, there's always this area of low pressure inside a tornado, right? So in the core of every vortex, there's an area of low pressure. Uh, if you think about when you look at the... Um, um, trailing uh, the contrails of an airplane, the reason why you can visualize that is because there are vortices in the, uh, w produce the wingtips of the airplane and the core of um, low pressure there is able to um, produce vaporization of the water in the air. And so you can see a little bit of uh, white 
area there it's just cloud it's just the, va the vapor that has condensed because there's low pressure so similarly here we have a low pressure area whenever we have a vortex so that low pressure area that is caused by this main vortex is creating some suction some extra su suction that is able to pull the um, body of the snake upwards producing some extra lift so here's a summary of the physics of what's happening here we have a um, trailing edge vortex, we have a leading edge vortex, and as this leading edge vortex detaches, uh, in this case we have this opposite side vorticity underneath here that helps the new vortex that is created remain closer to the surface and create extra suction. So we are able to use the wakes of the snake to explain the lift that they are able to generate so that they can glide a long distance with this very strange shape that doesn't look anything like an airfoil. It doesn't look anything like a wing. The reason why this is so effective for the snakes is that they operate at this range of Reynolds numbers, as I was saying, between the birds and the insects, where there's always a lot of air circulation, circulation a lot of vorticity. This is the work that you can read in a paper that we've, um, uh, is coming soon in Physics of Fluids. I wanted to tell you about the physics of this and rather than um, the code. But of course, if you are interested, you can get the code. Everything is open source. Um, the code can be downloaded and um, not only inspected, but you can actually run the experiments that are reported in this article. If you go to our website, you'll find links to where the data sets are available for you to download so that you can run the code and reproduce, if you're interested, these very same results. Uh, we have a policy of, um, of open science and open source in, in our group so that everything hopefully can be reproduced, and if it doesn't work, let us know. Um, future work, we are going, we're developing a multi-GPU version of this uh, simulation tool using Petsy as I was telling you it already we already have the um, the code that uses Petsy to run in multi uh, multi in a distributed environment and we're not ready to do multi GPU but it will be ready soon incorporating some uh, turbulent simulation this will allow us to do a full three-dimensional simulation of the flying snakes so as you were saw in the video earlier on, it's not just the cross section that matters, but there's also a lot of motion. The snakes actually undulate through the air, and we want to investigate the role of all those, those all of those different components. How, uh, how does the uh, undulation come come into play? How do different sections of the body interact with each other to produce perhaps uh, different sorts of forces, and so on? So we're looking forward to investigating all of those, um, those questions. But that's not the only interesting flying animal that we can investigate with CFD on GPUs. It turns out that there's a lot of, uh, there's many, uh, there are many animals that glide, animals that you wouldn't even imagine. There are, a, there's even a species of ants that is very clever. Here is a picture of the gliding ants. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but in fact, there is a species of ants that, um, is able to, as you can see here in this picture, adopt a skydiving posture as it falls so that it's able to control and um, produce a controlled aerial descent to, if it falls from a tree where it lives very happily, it can actually 90% of the time direct its descent to land right back at the trunk of that tree so that it can climb up and not fall on the undergrowth where it would be certainly eaten by a frog. So here we have another very interesting animal that glides and we want to investigate these animals because they can tell us many things about physics of fluids interacting with small objects and we want to learn about that to apply it in our engineering designs. All of this with uh, CFD on GPUs and if you're interested you can always follow us and get the codes as we uh, produce these new results. Thank you. Very, very cool, Lorena. Very cool. Thank you. Lorena has some time for some questions. Any questions on fluidity of snakes and agility of ants and the physics of it all? All right. Well, thank thank you. you again, Lorena. Oh, yes. Is that all on the host side or are you using any GPUs? 
GP is the PETC that you're using, is it all just in host code, or are you doing anything with any GPU accelerated functions in PETC? The PETC code is uh, the moment CPU only. Uh, the objective is to use the CUSP interface uh, to use GPU acceleration within Node. We're also hoping to convince our friends at NVIDIA to produce a interface to their new uh, algebraic multigrid software that they're producing so that we can call that from PETC as well. Because CUSP with PETC, they play nice, but it's very experimental as I understand. Can you talk a bit more about the type of hardware that you used and how many GPUs, uh, how large the computers were in simulators? These, uh, these, all of the simulations that produced the results that I talked about here were done in one GPU. So it was uh, C++ code running on one GPU. Uh, the size of the mesh, is, well, the size of the problem is more or less 4 million points in the order of 4 million points. Um, I had, I think, a slide here that showed um, the size of the mesh. And let's see if it's, uh, it was something like 1700 by 1700. I'm not too sure which is the um, right slide here to show you that. But 1700 by 1700, more or less, and they run between, um, you know, a number of hours, eight hours or something like that. Any other questions for Lorena? How do the snakes land? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. How do they land? Oh, they just bang on the ground flat, and they just are able to immediately adopt back their circular shape and slither away. Uh, they're very effective with that, but uh, you know they're able to reduce their vertical speed to a point that when they land, they don't hurt. They don't. They're not hurt. They're pretty good gliders for snakes. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you your again, attention. Lorena.